good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this next session, Exploring the Business of Sustainability. It's not that long ago that many businesses approached sustainability as something that needed a policy or a written statement, perhaps a strategy or plan, but was often written separately to their main aims, objectives, mission statement and business plan. And increasingly, it was expected of them. It went from a nice to have to a need to have. But as the challenges our planet and people are facing become more critical, more urgent, there's no longer simply an expectation for businesses to be more sustainable. They simply have to be, regardless of their size, their sector, their stage of growth. And that, of course, means there's a huge opportunity to build a business that's better for its people, better for its investors, better for the planet, better all round, and to build that from the very, very outset. Rather than see sustainability as a nice to have policy, our panel today will talk about how they've built it into their core businesses from the very beginning and share their tips on doing this simply and without huge expense. My name is Lynn Robertson. I'm the Enterprise Education Lead at Santander Business Banking. And over the past year, working with some amazing colleagues and partners, I've been increasingly looking at what we can do to better support our SME customers on their sustainability journey. So I'm really delighted today that I'm joined by Josephine Phillips, founder at Sojo, changing the fashion industry for the better by reimagining the clothing repair and tailoring sector. Jane Mycott, Enterprise Business Director at Kogo, on a mission to empower hundreds of millions of consumers and businesses worldwide to become conscious consumers by taking action to measure, reduce and compensate for their impact on the world. And Catherine Lawson, owner of Barefaced Foods, who left a 25 year career in education to pursue her own ambitions as a values driven entrepreneur in the food sector. And Catherine's keeping it very real today. She's joining us from the Bare Faced Food Kitchen. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Josephine, for joining us. Um, I don't like doing all the full introductions. I've given you a flavour of what our panel members do, but I'm going to come to them in turn and get them to talk a little bit more about their businesses and, and their, their approach to sustainability. So Josephine, could I come to you first of all? Can you tell us a little bit about Sojo and the journey that you've been on. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for having me, Lynn, and hello to everybody. Um, so yes, to start things off, obviously we are in the fashion space. And I think one thing that's really important to talk about is how destructive fashion is as an industry before going into anything that I'm doing or we're doing at Sojo. Um, and that is that it's something that people don't often know, I think, because of the glossy exterior, but fashion actually produces 10% of global carbon emissions. And in the UK alone, we actually send 13 million clothing items to UK landfill each week. Uh, and with a population of 60 million, that's a lot. Every week, 13 million is going to landfill. So on the back of that, I basically made my sustainability journey at the beginning of my first year of university when I started moving into sustainable fashion. I'm a recovered fashion hypocrite. I was really into fast fashion. I was the one who was buying the clothes from Zara and ASOS and I think we've all been there. Um, but I slowly realized how destructive it was as a sector. And unfortunately, because of sort of consumption being so ingrained in us in society, I decided to just move my model of consumption to a more sustainable one, which was secondhand clothing. It meant that I was shopping just as much um, but I was doing it in a more sustainable way, which it is, it is more sustainable. Um, but I kept facing a problem, which is very notorious for entrepreneurs coming up with their business idea. But I was shopping secondhand, which is an amazingly growing market uh, on the likes of Depop and things like that. Um, but I was finding that sizing was such a big issue. So I loved these clothes. I would find my perfect style. Uh, it was great value. It was good quality and it wouldn't be my size. And with secondhand, everything comes in one size. You can't go up and down because it's not firsthand fashion. So I wanted to alter my clothes to get them to fit me. 
Um, but I had absolutely no idea how to sew and neither does so much of my generation. It's after doing some market research, speaking to over 300 people, it was 81% of consumers didn't know how to sew. So I was like, there's this huge gap of people want to engage in fashion more sustainably with sustainably minded habits. They have no idea how to sew and they're used to the convenience economy because obviously there are your local tailors. But getting up and going somewhere for 15 minutes and getting undressed and getting dressed and getting pinned and then going back five days later felt like way too much time and effort for me. And so I set about building a solution, Sojo, which is a marketplace that connects you to your local seamster through our app and bicycle delivery service so that you can get your clothes fixed or fitted really easily. And for us, that was really important because sustainability so often comes in friction with convenience or even price. And one thing that I really wanted to do was to bring it to people's fingertips in a really simple way. And by doing so, we really hope to change the fashion space in terms of slowing down consumption, making fashion you know, engagement more mindful um, by repairing your clothes instead of throwing them away, reducing the amounts going to landfill. And by tailoring your items, you're able to sort of love them for longer, which is ultimately our aim. It's worth saying, that our sort of our app has been dubbed the delivery of clothing alterations and repairs and it works incredibly simply you say what you want done we pick it up and we drop it back three days later um, but we're currently going through a pivot where we are now partnering with brands for them to offer repairs on all those brands items for free um, and we think that's going to be really great in the move towards circularity and also accessibility when it comes to sustainable fashion I don't know if that's my five minutes but that's sort of a background on me um, and really excited to chat to you more about it Amazing. Thank you, Josephine. And can I just check, is the app available now for people to, to download? Yeah, definitely download it if you want to. We're only servicing London, um, but hoping to expand. So uh, definitely get downloading and engage with Sojo. Fantastic. We need to plug all of your businesses today. So that's important <laughs> to get that across. Thanks so much, Josephine. Jane, if I could come to you next, just to explain a little bit more about Kogo. Uh, I did chuckle to myself when we had Sojo and Kogo and I thought do I need to find another business that fits that model anyway um tell us a little bit more about Kogo Jane and the role you see it playing in driving sustainability you know I touched on the consumer and the business so I wonder if you could bring that to life for us yeah sure and I just um one of the reasons we were set up um, and exist is to signpost people that care and are trying to do things a bit more sustainably and ethically and find incredible businesses like Sojo. So um, I've already said, we need to get you into the Cogo app. Um, it's just incredible what you do. And that, that's it, it's so important that we can help um, individuals, consumers to find businesses like yours and play our part. So Kogo was set up about 10 years ago, in fact, as a charity, because our founder, Ben Gleisner, who's in New Zealand, saw this gap between people wanting to do something and not finding the businesses um, that could solve that problem for them. Or, or it found it really hard to navigate across, I suppose, all the different sustainability measures and, and um, accreditations in place. And also there's a lot of greenwashing going on. So it can be very hard as a consumer to cut through all of that noise to make really well-informed decisions. So Ben created this app where you could uh, kind of find it like a directory of great businesses that are ethical and sustainable. Um, we then converted into a business back in um, 2017. And I think the thing that we are now famous for is we've really deep dived, if you like, on carbon footprinting. So in May 2020, we brought to the world one of the first ever um, carbon trackers that connects um, all of your bank accounts and credit cards to give you an instant and very accurate and detailed carbon footprint so you can find out how where you spend and who you are spending with affects your carbon footprint um, and at a very top level some of the things that we encourage we have a second hand fashion action and uh, we have a rental fashion action so we're trying to encourage people and highlight just how much they would save based on what they've actually spent so if you took Josephine and had looked at perhaps a previous history she would have maybe seen that her uh, her spend in fashion lots of fashion from businesses that maybe had a very high carbon footprint if you can really understand exactly what that impact meant for the environment um, but perhaps also find some businesses you know our, our um, secondhand fashion would then help you find sustainable small businesses that can help you take some action so we're trying to give people better information to make better informed decisions and make it easier to reduce impacts 
Fantastic. Thank you, Jane. There's so much there that I want to unpick, so we'll get to that <laughs> in the questions. But Catherine, if I could come to you next, tell us more about the Bear Feast food journey and I guess what took you from education to food? And I mean, when you when we spoke last week, you talked so much about the values that drive what you do. And I just wonder if you could bring that to life for us, Catherine. Thank you for having me on, Lynn. It's always a pleasure to talk about the bare-faced food journey. Um, and it's been really interesting for me to hear the other two ladies speak today as well about their own sustainability journeys. Um, so Bareface Food started in January 2020 after I left teaching um, and that had been my career for 25 years and I left teaching after a burnout, um, I'll be very honest, I burnt out of teaching after 25 years of working with some of the most challenging young people across Scotland against a background of policies which at the very root of it didn't match my own values, the things that made me want to work with these young people. So in practice, I found that overwhelming in the end and decided that it was time for me to embark on a completely different journey. Um, and that's what brought me to the point where I made the decision to leave my teaching career and do what I'd always wanted to do, which was establish a food business. And at that time, while I was kind of recovering from a burnout from teaching, I did a lot of research around the food industry. And the more research that I did, the more information I found about how the food choices that we individually make impact our individual and collective uh, carbon footprint. So at that point, I decided that if I was going to go into the food industry, I was going to make that a focus for me. And it naturally led me to look at establishing a plant-based food business. Because for me, um, whether we do it some of the week or all of the week, making small changes to the food choices that we make allow all of us to collectively change what's happening with climate change. So in January, I established a barefaced bootable uh, side to the business where I started delivering nutritionally balanced plant-based meals direct to people's doors. Now, I started this in January 2020, and of course, COVID hit um, round about the March-April time, and I had to very quickly pivot from what at that time was my long-term plan to thinking, how am I going to get through the next few months? So I grew the business from there, focusing purely on delivery at this point in time, even although I had other ambitions for the business, but very much thinking if I can deliver nutritionally balanced meals to people at a time when we're all much more focused on what's happening to the environment, much more aware of our own health and well-being, then that's something that I can really push at this moment in time in our local communities. And in a sense, I think COVID um, sounds odd to say this, COVID probably launched us in a lot of ways because we found that we were working in a social dynamic that was changing very quickly. People were much more concerned about their own health and well-being. They were much more concerned about sustainability. And we were able to deliver on that agenda for them. As we were coming out of the, the pandemic and coming out of lockdown, I then faced the decision about where do I take the business now? Now, I always knew that the aim was there to create a sustainable food business, but a big part of what drove the establishment of Barefaced Food for me was looking at how we could create a business that offered social and economic sustainability as well within the local community. And that was a major factor, and that was where I was able to bring the 25 years of experience and education to play in my business op um, op operation as well. So for us, that meant looking at how can we provide a sustainable business in a community where there are young people at risk of unemployment, um, there's an economy that needs to grow coming out of a pandemic, and what are we going to do to help support that? And at all times of my business journey, the thing I always came back to is what was my why? Why am I doing this? What are the values that drive me? And when I found myself unsure of what direction to go, and I always came back to that question, and my business mentor at the time would push me on that, he would always come back and say, Catherine, go back to your why. Why are you doing this? And for me, it came back to, I want to add value. I want to add value socially, and I want to add value to my local community. And I knew that I was managing to address that through the food side. But as we came out of COVID, I knew I was then in a position to establish premises, that's, that's where I am today, and to start to deliver on the social sustainability side of things. So for us moving forward as a business, that means actively engaging young people to work with us. 
actively engaging young people who face challenging life circumstances, who have possibly not had a good road through education and who are at risk of unemployment. And when we look at how we as small businesses can change the trajectory of their life, if you like, change their outcomes, that then allows us to be part of a more sustainable socioeconomic picture within the local community. So for me, the journey around sustainability is twofold. It's around how as a plant-based food business, we can contribute to the, the planet's sustainability and how as a small business in a local community, we can help support socioeconomic growth by actively engaging as employers, the very people who are at risk of unemployment within our communities. It's incredible, Catherine. I mean, when I spoke to you last week, I just, it, it struck me of just how much your why is at the forefront as, of you, as you've just mentioned. Yeah. And I just wonder, I'm going to kind of get into a conversation now, but if I, if I can start with you, Catherine, yeah. I just wonder if, you know, you've balanced the whole thing of your profit. You want to make money because you want to be a financially, economically sustainable business, yeah. but you're underpinned by values and purpose and, and that why. Mm -hmm. uh, was there ever any doubt in your mind that that was the right approach in the business, that you could balance the two? Did you ever feel that one might outweigh the other, if that makes sense? No, I, I, I always felt it was impossible for me personally to drive a business where um, I didn't have the underpinning value set. For me, that is how, as a business, I will sustain our business operations. So you will, of course, meet young people and entrepreneurs, people who are, are young in the business world, who will want to establish a business purely for monetary gain. And I understand that for a lot of people, they see establishing a business as a means to making a lot of money. But for me, if that's the sole aim around establishing a business, that won't get us as far as we want to get. It certainly won't get us as far socially or economically, and it certainly will limit the good that we can do with the business as a vehicle to actually make change in our communities. So there was never any question in my mind about um, how I was going to balance that. The only thing I have to be careful for um, or of as a business uh, you know, entrepreneur is that I remember the money-making side of the business because mm -hmm. very often when you have got a, a values-driven um, business model, if you like, you, you can become so consumed by the good that you want to do and driving that aspect of the business that sometimes the other side, the um, being financially responsible when you're learning the business model, that can sometimes get lost. So for me, I have to make sure that I'm always looking at the two sides of the business. I don't want to lose the values-driven aspect and aspirations that I have for Bareface Food at any point in time and would I'll probably, if I'm honest, allow the values to outweigh the, the need to make profit at times because for me if I am not working within that values driven model um, I will not have the purpose and the satisfaction as an entrepreneur that I set out to have when I established Bareface Food. Thank you Catherine. Josephine maybe if I can come to you because actually you know you are at the beginning of that journey and you admitted to you know having been in fast fashion and that was what you're interested in how did you how did you consciously kind of shift those values and how I mean do you see the same challenges to Catherine that you need to get that balance because one could outweigh the other yes I think to start things off I didn't touch on it in sort of my in you know introductory speech but actually kind of like Catherine said for me I came into it the sustainability from a social perspective but actually I sort of was like especially around the 17 year old age I was really sort of an ardent feminist and I was like yeah feminism women women are women power like I loved it and then I realized that the brands I was supporting were exploiting hundreds of millions of women of color and I was feeding into that so I sort of was like wow my the way the place I'm putting my money is sort of fueling these you know rich white men at the top and these women of color at the bottom are being you know exploited and you know the labor rights violations were huge and I was fueling that so for me that's what immediately changed my opinion into more engaging in fashion in a more sustainable way because I thought I want to sort of shop my values and shop my habits then I learned about the whole environmental side of things but both of those passions have been intrinsically sort of inside me as I'm moving into the fashion space um one thing that I think is difficult is as you say sort of Catherine speaking about profit and values and I think 
one thing that I found really important is I really do want to build a really big profitable company because I think it's really important to show that making money doesn't mean you have to destroy planet. It doesn't mean you have to exploit people. It doesn't mean you have to be incredibly destru destructive. I really want to show that actually you can get a return for these amazing investors and venture capitalists who are obsessed with profit, whilst also not only not harming the planet, but doing good for the planet mm -hmm. because you're doing something circular and you're doing something game changing and regenerative and all this kind of thing. And so I think that that part really excites me. Um, but getting people on board with that is very important because I think you need to sell that vision, but also you need to be careful who you're taking money from because I think when it comes to decision making, the moment you're taking on investors, they have to not only be aligned with the profit side because sometimes decisions will be affected when it comes to balancing profit and values. You may want to make a decision, for example, with us, we want to, uh, like ultimately we want to, and hopefully in the next year, we want to employ our riders full time. Now, notoriously gig economy workers and frameworks don't do that because it's not beneficial to the company, but we want to do the whole full-time employment contracts, holiday pay, national insurance thing. And with some investors that might be like, no, no, that's not how gig economy works. It's sort of a race to the bottom. You want to pay them the least and all that kind of thing. So you have to get investors on board who believe in what you believe. And actually I was told by someone that you should write a list of why you shouldn't invest in me to eradicate those people who don't agree with your opinion. So you shouldn't invest in me if you don't believe in our workers being employed full time. You shouldn't invest in me if you don't believe in us paying one pound more per bag that we use because we wanna make it in an ethical way. So all those kind of things, you have to make sure the right people are on board and then the decisions are a lot easier because you're all on board with one mission, which is doing good and building a great company um, at the same time. Josephine, I think it's wonderfully refreshing to hear somebody talk so passionately about the desire to make money in this, <laughs> and, but the desire to balance that with the sustainability, the ethics, the values. And I think I, I've certainly seen a shift. I think over the past few years, businesses like yours would come saying, I need to establish as a social enterprise because that's the only way I can meet the values aspect of my business. Mm -hmm. and actually now what we're seeing is no, you can do both and you can focus on, on making money and building that financial side but with the balance of the, the values and the purpose behind it. So it's really refreshing to hear you talk about that so openly. But Jane, I just wonder if I could pick up on that funding piece because Kogo are going through a, a funding round at the moment. And I'm just wondering, you know, are you seeing a shift in funders? And lots of our audience today may be thinking about seeking funding and investment. So are you seeing a shift in how they fully comprehend that um, commercial opportunity can also come with the sustainability angle. Are they there yet on that journey? Oh, it, it, it's unbelievable. Yes. And I think it is changing by the month and by the minute. It's a very exciting space. I think just to pick up on that profit point, I mentioned before that Kogo started off as a charity and then changed into a business. And that's because the, the mission was always to reach millions of people and have impact. And actually, when you are a business, you are able to make more profit that you can put into product development and enable you to have the partnerships to reach millions of people. So I think that's a really good point you make. And um, our founder, I mean, he wants to, we were talking yesterday, he wants to create a, uh, we call it a rainbow unicorn, which is a unicorn business that is not about making billions of pounds. It happens to make billions of pounds because it's managed to reach its mission of millions of people, but the millions of pounds are not to make the founder rich. They are to have a good purpose. And we actually talk about divesting the ownership into individuals, more like a crown fund funding model at the end of Kogo's life. But moving on to um, the point you make, um, yeah, the market at the moment, I, I'd say the investment point that Josephine makes is really important. So Kogo for its early raises from kind of first pound through to just where we're at now, which is our series A rounds, has had about 120 investors that have been very, very tightly curated to be purpose driven, fundamentally purpose driven and long term. So they're not expecting to make a quick buck out of a tech company by you know, scrambling to do whatever it takes. It's there for the mission and the purpose, which is all about impact. So one of the measures that we're putting into our shareholder reporting will be how much CO2 have we managed to influence in reduction, not just how much money have we made. Um, and the same goes for Series A. 
it's got so um it's now very topical versus you know six months ago carbon footprinting with cop jacinda um in her address uh, to uh, cop 26 last week mentioned kogo you can imagine what that does for our inbound um, conversations but at the same time we are turning down anyone that looks like they're just in it because they want to invest in the latest bit of tech or that are also investing in fossil fuel companies or or, or fast fashion whatever and ben is very much like you josephine he he probably says no a lot more than he says yes and that's really important to the mission and it, it can be very hard to do but i think his he's always had the, that first and foremost impact mission. And he doesn't think money, he thinks money helps to do that, but it's not about his own profit. Just in terms of the stats around, you know, um, investment, what I think is really interesting. So we are, we set a target to raise 20 million US dollars. Um, we are easily going to exceed that. We will close the round early. Our nearest competitor is a company called Economy, a Swedish company who they've just raised 17 million for carbon footprint tracking. If you take Ecology, which most people are probably more familiar with in the UK that focuses on offsetting, they raised four million pounds in April and were valued, valued at about 16 million pounds as a company. They've just been revalued at 75 million. Um, this space is, it's hot without using a pun on climate change and it really needs to be. Um, but it, I, I think it's there. I think the time is absolutely right. And I think it, whether you are focusing completely on sustainability or not, you need to have it in the heart of your business because you will see investment falling away if you don't, because investors are increasingly looking for all of these measures. Thanks, Jean. That's a powerful message for our audience, because I think sometimes there's a fear that you'll switch funders off. And actually what Josephine and Jane, you're both saying is, you know, no, you'll, you'll, you'll switch them on. You'll switch them on. And, and we, in fact, some of the conversations we're having are around actually how can we help SMEs to reduce their footprints and have impacts? Because it seemed to be such an important in, um, factor in the SME space, both in terms of if it's not part of your core, you know, how do you get the support to make the changes you need to? But also in terms of lending, banks want to know how much risk there is across their lending portfolio and they want there to be some standard way to look at environmental social and governance the governance bit they've got pretty well covered environmental increasingly but social impact is there as well and and that will be sort of the scoring alongside the kind of traditional credit risk in terms of where where lending goes i'm, I'm absolutely sure of that from uh, mm -hmm. the conversations we're being involved with thank you jane um i just want to now think of the, the kind of the other side of this which is from consumers so um, there was a great session this morning from Mintel really talking about the changes in consumer behaviour when it comes to sustainability and thinking about the brands, Jane, you mentioned the greenwashing, having much more understanding around that. And I just wonder how much, and Catherine, maybe I can come to you first, how much you're seeing that shift in expectation from your customers and consumers. How much are they demanding from you what you know you exist to do, but are you seeing them be, be more vocal and demanding in that from you? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that's really surprised and, um, and delighted us, you know, when we are in the premises here, we get into some really interesting conversations with consumers. So we have customers that come in that are regulars. We have customers that come from different places because they've heard about our approach to food. And we get into some really interesting conversations around the impact that we can make through our food choices um, and the link to sustainability through our everyday choices that we make. And I think it's good and right that consumers are almost holding us accountable about the choices we make as a business, about the provenance of our food, about how seasonally we eat, how seasonably we would buy, and talking to us about every aspect of the food industry. And it's been a surprise to me because it's highlighted just how knowledgeable consumers now are. It's highlighted the wealth of information that's at everybody's fingertips. People are really engaging with the sustainability agenda here. And that's hugely supportive for us as a business because it means that our customers are engaging with us as a business and as a community in our, in our, in our own right. Um, so the conversations that we have are interesting because what we've always set out to do is to offer plant-based food that gives people choices. And we deliberately didn't go around using um, the word vegan. 
And we deliberately chose not to do that because we felt that for some people that turns them off from plant-based eating because they felt that veganism in and of itself is an all or nothing approach to, to food. So what we do when we have people that come in and they're maybe not sure about plant-based food is that we talk to them about how it's just a choice that you can make. It's not an all or nothing approach. We're not here to bang the drum about veganism. We're here to show that whatever choices you make in your day-to-day -day life can impact your own personal carbon footprint. And once we have that conversation, people really engage and hook into it and start talking to us about what are you doing as a business. So for me, it's about opening up the dialogue with consumers, for us, our customers on a face-to-face -face daily, daily basis. Open up that conversation, talk to them about what you're doing as a business, because the more you talk about what you're doing as a business and ask their opinion and talk to them and get them to question you, that I think the longer standing the relationships will be with the customers at the end of the day. So they talk to us about simple things like my food packaging, for example. Is your food packaging recyclable? Absolutely. Is it compostable? Yes. So they want to know, we have customers that will come and say, if we're going to get a delivery from you, we'd rather not use one-off packaging. Can we bring our own tubs in? And you think that's fantastic. That's the kind of engagement. Those are the small changes you want to see because collectively those small, small changes have a big impact. So they do ask questions of us. They do hold us accountable. They do question where our food comes from. They do question things around our packaging. And we're delighted that they do because all of those conversations open up bigger conversations around the choices that we all make individually and collectively and the impact that we can have together. Catherine, thank you. Josephine, I guess, naturally come to you because from fashion, and you spoke earlier, you mentioned that friction between sustainability and convenience, and actually the fashion industry is the one that's had possibly the biggest spotlight over it recently. But from your engagement with consumers, are you getting a similar experience to Catherine? Are they, are they becoming more demanding of what you're doing? Yeah, I think one thing that has been so incredible has been that we had our launch earlier this year and the reception, the organic reception has been so incredible. We yet, we're yet to sort of put any money behind customer acquisition. You know, our customer acquisition is zero pounds and everything has been completely organic. Our community has grown to over 11,000 organically. And we also um, have had such incredible press with like full features in Vogue and the Times and Harper's Bazaar. And all of that is because everyone is ready for this change. Um, I mean, it's very important to not Talk about everyone because we are slightly in an echo chamber when it comes to sustainability and you think everyone's on board with it and and there's still so much to do but what's really exciting about right now is it seems to be that the market is unbelievably receptive the consumers are really receptive to what we're building and that has been really fantastic and again kind of like Catherine was saying when it comes to what we're doing and getting people to repair clothes really easily we hope that the trickle down effect is like a circular mindset you know that means when something else breaks you try and repair that and, and it's sort of about you know our mission of making it mainstream and making repairs mainstream we will not be moving away sort of from fashion but in people's minds and in consumers' behaviours. We hope that just in general, as we talk about slowing down consumption and changing the way you engage with fashion, that that actually affects the rest of their life as well. Um, and that the impact is sort of broader. And I think one thing for us is it's very important with our consumers to give them our service, but we also love talking about sustainability more broadly and we love engaging them with educational content and they seem really receptive to it. And I think it's kind of like, we're now at this great point where startups are doing it and consumers want it. And it's sort of hopefully gonna be this sort of snowball effect where it just keeps going. The momentum that is very necessary is actually there. Fantastic. Thank you, Josephine. And Jane, of course, you're seeing the consumer behaviour kind of like, you know, very intensively because of what Kogo does, you know, that they're demanding this from us. Yeah. Um, and I, I could listen to both uh, Josephine and Catherine talk all day about their businesses because it, it, it's so exciting. And I, I think um, to Josephine's point, we do sometimes risk that falling into the echo chamber a bit and I suppose a really good example is that Kogo has its own app in the UK and that is brilliant for people that want to find sustainable businesses um, but obviously the people that probably download a carbon footprint tracking app and, and use it are probably not the ones that need to know their carbon footprint the most because they're probably already super aware and it definitely helps them out but one of the things that Kogo has done and this um, 
you know, in our conversations with banks, and we did a fantastic partner with uh, a pilot with Santander earlier in the year. But yesterday, um, the UK will have seen for the first time in the NatWest banking app, you go in to check your bank balance, and in your spending, you will have your carbon footprint. Now, that's going to 8 million NatWest customers, some of whom will go, what is that? I'm not interested. But the awareness is going to start to build. It's becoming mainstream. And for me, when you have brands like Tesco that are talking a lot about sustainability to a very mainstream broad audience, it's not your Guardian readers and your Waitrose shoppers or those that can afford sustainability. It's really becoming mainstream. Then actually the, the next part, so the first part is awareness. The second part, again, as Joseph absolutely, jo Joseph, Josephine nailed this point was, you have to make it easy because there are some people that will go out of their way to be sustainable for the majority, um, unless it's made simple to do, unless it's actually the more convenient option and it's it, it, it's super easy to understand. There are still those barriers that remain. And I think the excitement for me is people are now thinking about how to make this simpler or how it's not always the expensive option. Um, secondhand fashion repairing is actually a really, it's really topical with the macroeconomic stuff going on right now, which is that we are seeing a real squeeze on, on people's incomes. And that's where um, using stuff for a bit longer and repairing it, it's kind of good old fashioned things that we've forgotten um, in the kind of cheap, convenient um, spend, spend, spend that we've been through in, in the last few decades. And um, for me, getting to millions of people where they are already doing daily tasks, such as managing their money, that's how we really impact the millions of people, not perhaps just the, the green people um, that are already most of the way there. Thanks, June. And just, I think maybe building on that um, accessibility side, I want to look at this from a different perspective, which is for our audience today. I mean, what are the, the simple, low cost steps that they can take to start embedding sustainability in from now, regardless of what their main proposition is, regardless of what sector they're in? What can they do now? And Jane, maybe start with you, given that you have an amazing uh, tool that people can use <laughs> yeah I, I think um I would say very much um for SMEs watch this space because almost every large corporation I'm talking to is now trying to solve these problems but you don't have to have perfect measurement to start doing things and a lot of the things that you can do for your business are also going to save you money so for example have you got um a current product that is quite wasteful can you reduce waste which would actually be more efficient for you? Um, are you a renewable energy provider for your buildings or for or how your products are delivered? Again, Josephine mentioned um, using bikes. Well, that, that's a really good way of building into your system that may well save you money as well. Um, so I think some of the obvious things like your energy usage, generally how much stuff are you using and also what happens to your products afterwards or your service? What is it that you are doing that has an impact beyond the sale part, because that is something that is really important. You know, um, a right to repair is, is a new regulation that some European countries have already taken on. I think most of us know how frustrating it is if your phone stopped working or your laptop, that it's very, very difficult to repair some of these items. And it's going to become regulated that you need to have products that are repairable. And I'm sure this will sweep across different industries and hopefully into the UK. So I think thinking through what you were doing from start to finish um, and just think about it in terms of what's the biggest impact? Because we sometimes hear from people that are, are debating you know, things like, should I have a hand dryer or paper towels in the toilet? If you're still using non-renewable energy, it doesn't really matter. You know, focus on the big stuff, fix that. And then over time, just little steps can really make a difference. But just start taking some action. Does that resonate with you, Catherine, in terms of those small steps? You know, yeah. does it, you know, for you, the investment you make into your compostable packaging, for example, yeah. is that significantly more expensive? Or are you seeing that? Is that actually a really accessible way for you to introduce this to your business? 
Yeah, I think absolutely. And um, there is a, a slight cost to that, but it's a cost that, as a business, we are prepared to pay and pass on to the consumer. And in the conversations that we have with our customers, they are more than happy if we said, for example, we're going to add 20 pence on to every item because that's the cost, you know, for us to get more sustainable packaging. They are more than happy to do that because we've brought them on that sustainability journey with us and because we're getting into these conversations with them. But as a business, I absolutely agree with what Jane's saying around make sure you're doing something, make sure you're taking small steps all the time towards that sustainability goal that you have as a business. If you're new and you're establishing, it's impossible to go in and get everything right at once. And I think we have to kind of take almost the fear out of a sustainability strategy, if you like, as a business, so that people know that every step that they take is a step in the right direction. Now, if you go in at the start and all your suppliers don't have the sustainability philosophy that you like, then work with the ones that do and actively seek the ones that you know that, that you want to bring on board through time. But it's not, I, I don't think any business can go in and get it 100% right because we're all learning. We're all learning along the way and we're learning together. But I think one of the things um, that I would say to, to small businesses that are starting out is create a network around you. Make sure you're working with and linking with people who have the same mindset, who have the same sustainability goals, who can link you with the right people, who can help you achieve your business sustainability aims, whether that's suppliers, whether it's people that can help you to, like Jane, work out your carbon footprint. How are you doing in that respect? But don't see it as something that's overwhelming. Don't see it as something that's out with your reach as a small business, because literally every step we take as individuals and as small businesses contributes towards the greater societal aim of tackling climate change. Such an important message, Catherine, those small steps and the network that you build around you. And just yeah. picking up on this on the supply chain aspect, I mean, Josephine, again, fashion industry and supply chain, well, there's a whole afternoon's conversation, but... You know, how, how would you say you're starting out, how do you approach this without it becoming overwhelming, without it becoming a, an enormous expense for a, for a startup? Yeah, I think I completely agree with, um, sorry, is that, yeah, no, I think that's fine. Now I, do. Good. Um, I completely agree with uh, what Jane was saying in terms of just taking it bit by bit. And I think that whole, I mean, right before we did so started Sojo, I wrote down every single part of the journey of the business and um, just trying to look at what, you know what you're doing at each part and what it, even even when we were thinking oh we are altering clothes how fantastic but actually in the alteration process there might be a cut off of material and then where is that seems to pushing it are they pushing that little bit of material into a bin and so you've really got to think through everything but one thing that I would say as well is Lynn when you mentioned like what is a good low cost way for people to be approaching sustainability in their businesses I think they shouldn't actually be looking at it from a low cost lens and like Catherine mentioned you need to accept the cost mm -hmm. and accept that the cost actually is a really great business decision because ultimately sustainability is on the agenda. It's only going to keep being on the agenda. Unsustainable businesses will not be here um, at whatever point in the future. And so whatever cost you're putting towards now becoming a sustainable company or embedding sustainable practices, you're benefiting from it because customers will pay more for it and you hopefully can charge them for it. But you're also benefiting, benefiting from it from a business development standpoint because you're safeguarding your future in an industry where on a macro market level, we're moving towards sustainability. So I think that whatever decision you're making when it comes to what bag you're using or not what bag you're using, that extra cost, accept it and accept that it's a good business decision as opposed to purely based on morals. If we're just going from a sort of yeah, business standpoint, it's still the right thing to do. Um, so I think definitely, definitely incorporating that. And as Catherine says, put it onto the customer if necessary. Just let them know because I think that transparency, that honesty, I mean, there's a fashion brand that on their receipt, it says it literally breaks down what amount of the cost that you've paid goes to which thing and it says sort of you know 10 pounds of this was for the material raw, raw, raw materials taken from a cotton farm xyz 10 you know another 10 pounds was for us to package and send it another 10 pounds was for the labor of the person who sewed it another 10 pounds and so actually you just see what your money going towards and then they're transparent about the 17 pounds at the end is for them to make money and that goes into the business and I think that that allows people to feel comfortable in what they're paying and so that's a really good way to tackle it if you want to increase prices but don't know how to communicate it. Josephine, a fantastic message for us to end on. I really want to carry on, but I'm looking at the clock and I know we need to wrap up, but I think this, and I don't know where the time's gone, but I think this angle of 
the transparency, your message around, if you don't do this, you ain't gonna survive as a brand, as a business, because that consumer demand that Jane's seeing driving through Kogo is not gonna go away. Um, and Catherine, I think, you know, what you've taught us is that balance and that whole importance of the why behind what you're doing and sticking resolutely to that mm -hmm. to drive your business, that money is not a dirty word in this space at all. Mm -hmm. So I would like to really thank the three of you. This has been a brilliant conversation. We'd love to continue. Maybe we can have a part two sometime, you never know. Um, and I really hope that's been helpful for the audience. And um, please do, you know, watch us on, on demand if you want to just revisit any of the things that we've spoken about today, but enjoy the rest of the session. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And I don't know if you can hear me there, Lynn, and the wonderful panel. Lynn, first of all, thank you so much. That was just heartwarming. Um, Josephine, Catherine and Jane, I mean, the work that you're all doing is just absolutely phenomenal. I think that was just food for the spirit for the soul encouraging for everybody just you know that was just full of that would be very very difficult to do a highlights reel of it would be <laughs> because every word you said was just a gem i hope that people do follow up and follow up your business i was desperately trying to find all the businesses online on social media but thank you so much lynn thank you so much to the santander team thank you so much for all of you for spending your time and your wisdom and your your heart and your passion for this i'm sure it's been inspiring to anybody to everybody regardless of their business so thank you so much it's been such a joy Good afternoon and welcome back to those of you who've joined us this morning. It's been a fantastic morning so far and I've really thoroughly enjoyed listening to all the sessions. I'm so delighted to be back at the Business and IP Centre Startup Day and in particular during this Global Entrepreneurship Week. I love that we've managed to reach over 20 libraries around the UK this year. A big well done to all the team for pulling this together and inspiring a whole new group of budding entrepreneurs. It's no coincidence that Startup Day falls today on the 11th of November, Armistice Day. Earlier today, we honoured the lives lost in service of this country. We thank the armed forces of Britain and the Commonwealth, as well as their families, the emergency services and many others for the sacrifices they've made and for protecting country during conflict. It really resonated with me as I started to think about the sacrifice many of us have learned about sacrifice of a different nature over the last 18 months, both personally and professionally, as we've struggled to either keep businesses afloat or lost jobs, loved ones, and reimagined a world where we've had to learn to live with a pandemic. As COP26 continues in Glasgow, We've learned about the sacrifices we'll all need to make to protect the planet for future generations. We really must take this seriously now. I know I was absolutely shocked by some of the statistics from our Survive and Revive research carried out earlier this year. A staggering one in five businesses have had to halt their plans to reduce their businesses' carbon emissions due to COVID-19. And even more shockingly, a third of UK SMEs have no plans at all to reduce carbon emissions. It's clear we need some sort of intervention, with almost half of UK companies surveyed saying that reducing their carbon footprint is low on their list of business priorities. However, and perhaps more encouragingly, a quarter of business owners would like to make reductions to their carbon emissions, but don't know where to start. And almost half feel it's their responsibility to help reduce their business carbon footprint. What's clear is that we need support from government, with three out of five companies saying the government should implement regulations to ensure businesses reduce emissions, and the same number saying that they just haven't made any changes yet. Last week, we heard that larger companies would start reporting the sustainability targets, but it shouldn't stop at large companies. It's becoming increasingly important that businesses of all sizes start to acknowledge, measure and manage these impacts. 
We're facing many global challenges, from social inequality to environmental degradation, that will ultimately affect the ability of companies to carry out their operations. What's more, businesses have, in the past, played its role in creating some of these problems. From CSR to ESG, corporate citizens to triple bottom lines, sustainability can be a minefield of acronyms and jargon. Not only that, but each definition also comes with disagreements and challenges, and it's rarely applicable across all industry. That's why we've worked with James Gaffrey at B Lab UK, home to the B Corp movement a global community of people using business as a force to good to demystify the complex world of sustainability and support information with a concise webinar to watch. More information can be found at our website. It's crucial that businesses play a significant role in encouraging more sustainable behaviour. Through collaboration with consumers and government, businesses and their owners will help accelerate action to tackle the climate crisis and make a positive impact in society. In fact, just last week, we were speaking to one of our customers, Catherine Lawson, owner of Bareface Food, who you've heard from earlier in our session, of course. We've supported Bareface Food, the vegetarian and plant-based catering service provider, since their launch in January 2020. Most recently, we included them in our breakthrough marketplace in branch digital advertising boards, putting them at the forefront of local consumers free of charge. To date, we've featured over 260 local businesses in our branches and our website through Marketplace. With COVID on the horizon, Catherine had to move away from her original plan before she even started and instead built a business as a food production and delivery service, focusing on plant-based foods. The nutritious, delicious plant-based options Catherine's company make fit so well into a rapidly growing market, which appeals to established vegans, those curious about plant-based lifestyles, and those seeking those free from options. With increasingly important global focus on reducing our carbon footprint, they attracted and kept a wide customer base committed to making a positive difference to the impact they have on the environment through their food choices. As trading improved post lockdown and shops started to reopen, Catherine was finally able to realize her dream and open her cafe in air. The cafe has been open for four months now and from a slow start, she's seen the business grow steadily. Only last Saturday, she achieved double the sales activity from her first trading month. Local media coverage combined with the marketplace adverts have helped drive traffic to her website, which has also brought trade from outside the area. A reminder that our breakthrough website has free toolkits on how to use PR and marketing to help your business grow. Time and again, through our interactions with small businesses, we're seeing a focus on sustainability. It's no longer a nice to have, but an essential. Just last month, Santander celebrated the achievements of over 80 early stage startups from across the UK at our Santander X Entrepreneur Awards. All of them pitched their business ideas across quarter and semi-final heats that were whittled down to five finalists. The finalists then pitched their business ideas to a panel of esteemed judges at the event held at Wembley Stadium in London. And I was so lucky and privileged to have the opportunity to attend. Sojo, founded by Josephine Phillips from King's College London, is working to make the fashion industry circular by making clothing alterations and repairs mainstream. She won the top prize of £50,000 of seed funding and 25000 worth of individual additional business support. Runner-up Deploy, which provides game-changing innovation and water management from Imperial London College, received 25000 of seed funding and 25000 worth of additional business support. What's really noticeable this year is that over 90% of the entrants to these awards has sustainability focused at the core of what their business idea was. 
a real marked change from even what we saw two or three years ago. The impact of COVID on many small businesses has been devastating. But one thing it has highly highlighted is the need to revisit supply chains, to consider sourcing local products, to shop locally, and to raise consumer awareness of the importance of healthy lifestyles and the health of our environment, meaning there's a greater level of interest in this type of food, clothes, and products we produce. A recent autumn Santander trade barometer showed that despite the bounce back in confidence and performance since the spring, UK businesses are bracing themselves for ongoing disruption to supply chains well into next year. Over a third of UK businesses are anticipating those issues to continue for the next 12 months, with the barometer showing that this is now the greatest challenge anticipated, followed by labour shortages. That's why we're encouraging you all to think local. Consider what you can do to work with other small businesses near to you. We've already started to introduce some of our small businesses to local businesses, and next year we'll really continue to expand this initiative. But it goes well beyond supply chains. How else can we all play our part? Well, our customer Earth Refresh, based in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland has a few ideas. They too have featured on marketplace banners recently, showcasing their eco-friendly household goods. These include bamboo toothbrushes, dish brushes and soap racks, beeswax, food wraps, toothpaste, tablets, cleaning sponges and cloths, and more plastic-free products to help you. The company was started last year in January as a mission to reduce plastic waste in the community and in the wider region. The business aims to educate people about shopping sustainably and focusing on creating less waste in the home. And I'm particularly proud to be supporting this one as the founder is one of our members of staff, Kirsten Monaghan, who's a branch cashier. She began selling online through her website and started off with a small few products, but is adding more regularly when it's possible. The business is reducing carbon emissions by planting a tree for every order sourcing as many local products as possible and making sure products and packaging are free from single-use plastic. The business is also planning litter picking around the community, which aligns with the values to improve the current state of the environment. Kirsten's next step and ambition is to open a shop and sell cleaning product refills and allow customers to bring in their own containers to buy food products. Absolutely fantastic. And I had the pleasure of catching up with Kirsten last week, and it was so humbling to hear all her plans and ideas um, that she wants to make a difference in society. We've heard some really powerful examples of the difference we can make. And that's why I'm delighted to tell you that we're going one step further than the net zero commitment we've already made earlier this year. We wanted to do something on a more practical level to help our SME customers. This week, we launched a new programme where we'll support SMEs to recruit or upskill their existing talent to focus on the company's sustainability strategy. Businesses can nominate themselves to access levy funds from Santander across three core training areas, a business fundamentals programme, project management and data fellowships. Applications are open until the 5th of December and the programme will begin next year. As always, more information is available on our website. The pandemic has created a spirit of inclusivity within and across communities, making consumers more receptive to initiatives and drive inclusion and support within society. Let's all take this opportunity and start to make our own sacrifices for the benefit of our community and future generations who will inhabit the planet. The time is to act now. Thank you all.